The geologic column is a hoax. One of the biggest lies ever passed off on humanity, but the vast majority of the world believes it, even though it doesn't exist. When they started teaching that in the 1830s, people began to change their worldview away from what the Bible teaches to this new view from Charlie Lyell, the lawyer from Scotland, that each layer was a different age. This teaching really had a strong influence on a young preacher from England. There was a fellow that just graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. His name was Charles Darwin. The only degree Darwin ever got was a theology degree. And today they call him a great scientist. All he got was a theology degree. Which is not bad, I mean, but he, you know, he's not a scientist. Charles Darwin set sail on board the Beagle. He's going to sail around the world and collect bugs for somebody back in England. And he decided to bring some books with him to read. He's going to be gone for five years. As he sailed around, he brought with his Bible, and he brought with that book by Charles Lyell, Principles of Geology. That book changed his life forever. Darwin later wrote to a friend and said, Disbelief crept over me slowly. I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. By the way, later when he died, his wife started the rumor that he repented on his deathbed. That rumor still circulates today, but apparently his wife made up the whole thing. Nobody knows for sure, but that's what the best research says. Darwin sailed around the world. He stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. There on those islands, Charlie noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches, a little bird about this big. But their beak shape was different. Now, Charlie didn't like birds too well. I mean, he raised pigeons, but he also liked worms. He was a strange guy. So he shot all kinds of birds, thinking, you know, he would help the worms out, give them a better chance of survival. Because birds ate worms, and he thought that might be kind of hard on the worms, so he shot all the birds he could find. Well, he collected all these birds, and he noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. He studied them carefully and said, you know what, folks? I think all these birds have a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> and then Charlie said, you know, maybe this proves that birds are related to bananas. He said, oh, he didn't say that. Oh, he sure did. I got his book right here. Charlie Darwin said in his book on page 170, he said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Isn't he saying the birds and the bananas are related? He sure is. That's a lie. There's no proof any animal is related to a different kind of animal, other than maybe a common designer. Charlie noticed what is sometimes called microevolution. I don't like that word. I think it confuses kids. Okay, I'm going to use it, but you understand what I mean. Microevolution is actually just a variation, okay? Dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. Nobody argues about that. It's a fact, folks. It happens. The question is, does it go any farther than that? Does it go into what we call macroevolution, where it changed to a different kind? Walt Brown, in his book in the beginning, an excellent book, by the way, he says microevolution is horizontal. Macro would be vertical, changing to a different kind. Another way to illustrate it. Dogs probably had a common ancestor. Even the Great Dane and the Chihuahua probably had a common ancestor. I wouldn't question the fact that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. We had one try it earlier in the seminar. We had, had a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. We asked the five-year-old, which one is not like the others? He got it right away. The banana. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. National Geographic here has an article from wolf to wolf, how the dog evolved from a wolf. <laughs> I don't argue with that. It probably did. But it's still the same kind of animal. Here's Mickey Mouse evolving. <laughs> yeah. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind, not after their species. But this guy says, the results of this and other similar surveys are startling because evolution has been a settled issue for science in science for nearly 150 years. They found out that 46% of adults in the United States do not think humans had evolved. Well, you better define what you mean by evolved. Right, the majority of folks do not think they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe, but don't call it science. Evolution has six different meanings. First, you'd have to have cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. Secondly, you'd have to have chemical evolution. The hydrogen from the Big Bang would have to evolve to all 92 elements, plus the synthetic ones. 
then you'd have to have what we call stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. And nobody's ever seen a star form. We see them blow up all the time. And yet there's enough stars out there that everybody on planet Earth can own two trillion of them to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones we don't know about. <laughs> then we'd have to have what we call organic evolution, the origin of life. Nobody has a clue how life can get started from non-living material. We'll cover more on that in the next session about the origin of life. Next, they have what's called macroevolution, changing from one kind of animal into another. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. And lastly, we have variations within the kind that some people call microevolution. Okay, this one happens, whatever you call it, it happens. The first five are purely religious. But the definition of the word evolution is really confused for the students on purpose, I believe. I think it takes a giant leap of faith and logic just to go from micro to macro. It sure takes a big leap to go to the other four stages. Macroevolution is a fantasy based on imagination. They believe it must have happened, but there is no evidence for it at all. Teachers, though, will give the students one definition of the word to get them to believe the theory, and then they slowly read in the rest of it when they're not looking. They're going to say, evolution is descent with modification. That's deceitful. That's not really what they mean by evolution. This textbook says, evolution is change over time. First definition. Watch how they change the definition now. In other words, living things have changed over time. <laughs> Wait a minute. What happened to the first four stages? You're going to skip all the way down to living things and just assume the first four happened? Mm -hmm. Then they say, evolution is a change in species over time. Now they jumped right down to what I believe in. I believe species can change over time. I think the changes are limited. Still the same kind. But you might, somebody might call it a different species. It's still the same kind of animal. That's not really what they mean by evolution, folks. What they really mean is the whole theory comes as a package deal. Variations certainly happen, but they have limits. Haven't the farmers been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? No, I bet there's a limit in there someplace, isn't there? I'm not sure if they reached it or not, but they're get to get, probably getting close to the limit of pig size. Roaches eventually become resistant to pesticides. That's a fact. Do you think they'll ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? <laughs> no. I bet there's a limit. They always still produce the same kind of plant or animal, too. No new information is added. See, real evolution would mean an increase in genetic complexity, not just shuffling genes that already exist. When you have varieties of dogs produced, the gene pool is more limited for the variety. The chihuahua is swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool. <laughs> Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop a chihuahua. All that time and money to make a dog that is 100% useless. <laughs> hey, how long would the chihuahuas last in the real world? Turn them all loose back into the woods and watch what happens. They'd run up to the wolf. Yep, 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 yep. Crunch. End of gene pool, right? <laughs> Genetic information is lost, not added, when you get your variety. Real evolution would be an increase in genetic complexity, not just shifting of gene frequency. Now, I grew up in Illinois, corn country. Did you know there are so many kinds of corn down there they have to number them? You're driving down the highway and you'll see a sign, you know, BX65, don't mix it up with XL29, something will explode. But I'll tell you what, folks, you can crossbreed corn from now till the cows come home and you're always going to get corn. You're never going to get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk, okay? That ain't going to happen. There's a varieties of dogs in the world, a whole bunch of them. And I bet they had a common ancestor, a dog. This Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Saying the terrier and the poodle had a common ancestor? Oh, come on, don't give it a fancy name. It's still a dog. Don't call it divergent evolution. It's a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. Looked like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment, folks. I mean, a horse, all right? And every kid knows they're the same kind of animal. They've got little bitty horses available today. We had the world's smallest horse come visit us in Dinosaur Adventure Land. Talk about useless. Can't ride it. It won't bark. <laughs> no, my granddaughter wrote it. She thought it was cool, I think. I don't know if she thought anything. Uh, 
You know, horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred. There's some folks in California, they wrote me a letter, said, Brother Hovind, we crossbreed all sorts of these animals and get some really strange crossbreeds. We get zorses, zonkeys, zionis, and zedonks, and shebras. There's a herd of zebroids running around. <laughs> See, the Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. A horse and a zebra can bring forth. A horse and a hamster cannot. They're a different kind, okay? And most cases, the kinds are real recognizable to anybody with average intelligence. There might be a few questionable ones in there. Okay, I think that's worthy of research. But the fact that we don't have the answer to every single one doesn't prove that everything is related, like the evolutionist says. You know, in the last 100 years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 down to 123. Now, even back in the early days, they had some low times turned in. Question, how much money would you guess has been spent on the Kentucky Derby trying to get faster racehorses? Millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? I don't know if they reached the absolute limit of horse speed or not. I suspect they're getting pretty close. I mean, if you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? <laughs> hmm? My whole point is, sure, variations happen, but they're limited. The evolutionist does not want to admit there are any limits, and that's where the problem comes in. There's a variety of cows in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. A cow. Here's a book you can order chickens from. What kind of chickens do you want to get, kids? You want to get red rocks, cinnamon queens, white rocks, cherry eggers, brown leghorns? There's a lot of different kinds of chickens you can get. But look what the book says. The jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Hey, did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? Guess what it was? A chicken. <laughs> exactly correct. There are eight varieties of bears in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue with that, but it was a bear. Did you know that broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, all, and cabbage all came from a common ancestor? It was a plant. Mm -hmm. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Here's what happened, though. James Hutton wrote a book, and people began to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Then along came Charlie Lyle, and he wrote a book, and people began to doubt the flood formed the layers. Then along came Charlie Darwin, and people began to doubt the Creator. And by the mid-1800s, the world was in kind of a problem because uh, they didn't think God did it, but they didn't know how it got here, so uh, they looked around and said, well, if God didn't make this place, who's in charge? It must be us. That led to the rise of humanism, communism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism. It all ties together. We cover all that on video five. But those same three false teachings are still in your textbooks today. But teaching kids the earth is millions of years old. We got here by uniformitarian processes, and godless evolution is how it happened. Paul said, Timothy, you be careful about science that is falsely so-called. Evolution is not science. Evolution's a religion. Hitler said, let me control the textbooks and I'll control the state. Professor Wilson from Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. First year in college, destroyed his faith. I suspect that might be what happened to Tom Hanks. I read an article where he was 16 years old. Wrote an, he wrote about how much he loved the Lord, wanted to serve him with his life. What happened, Tom? I've been praying for Tom a lot. I'm going to try to get him saved. I'm sending him some of my videotapes here soon. I don't know why I'm burdened for him, but I just am. Many people go off to college and lose their faith. Scott wrote me a letter from Iowa. He said, Brother Hovind, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound. My college history class helped to destroy that faith. I started to doubt the Bible and God's Word. I even started to doubt Jesus was truly God's Son and that He died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes, and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought I knew about life was changed. Yay, rescued one. But there are millions more that need rescued. There are kids doing homework right now, tonight, while we're sitting here, and that homework is destroying their faith. 75% of kids from Christian homes who go to public schools are going to lose their faith after one year of college. What's in these books, anyway? What are they teaching our kids? They tell them they've got evidence for evolution. 
Here's the evidence they give them. Evidence from fossils. Oh, come on. Anybody with half a brain knows no fossil counts as evidence for evolution. None. You bring some bones into the courtroom. Your Honor, see these bones right here? These are the ancestors of everybody today. <laughs> Any freshman law student could say, oh, Your Honor, he doesn't know those bones had any kids that lived. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? You know, produce something other than their kind? Fossils simply don't count, folks. No fossils count as evidence for evolution. They say, we've got evidence from structure, molecular biology, development. They say, the process of evolution is by natural selection. There's no scientific evidence to support evolution except things that have been proven wrong years ago. And we're going to cover some of those here tonight. Now, if real evidence exists for that theory, then please show me. I'm not against scientific evidence. I am against lying to the kids. And everything they use to teach that theory to your kids has been proven to be a lie. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they say mutations make something new. That's never been observed. Number two, they say natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Now think about this carefully. If an animal evolves a little better than the rest, what must happen to the rest of them in order for this process to work? They all have to die or else the good genes get blended back into the population. Evolution is a religion of death, not life. The question is very simple. Did man bring death into the world like the Bible says, or did death bring man into the world like evolution says? They are polar opposite, and one of them is wrong. 